Greetings. Welcome to Calm Clear Conversations. I'm Christopher Johnson with Calm Clear Communications. And with me today is none other than author Sarah Townsend. Welcome. Hello. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me on. So I would say good morning, but well, Sarah, we're not in the same time zone. Not quite. No, no. It's 3 p.m. <laughs> here in uh, in Gloucestershire in the UK. Well, and see through the magic of the internet, we can have a conversation across time zones and have fun. It's pretty cool. It is. Survival skills for freelancers. Mm. All right. I happen to have a copy right here. <gasps> <laughs> You haven't had the paperback, have you? You listened to No, that I I have the audio book, and we're going to talk about that. Um, I became aware of you through a common connection, John Sperian. Yeah, John's great. He is, and it's like, oh well, I I immediately started following you. That was on Twitter. Then I became aware of your book, and then we connected on LinkedIn. The, the book, I have to say, the, our exchange about the book, I found amusing. Okay. <laughs> well, all right. So I got a copy, you know, I, I, I downloaded the audible version of the book and then you expressed a little bit of, hey, wait a second, he's going to be listening to me read. <laughs> and you do voiceovers yourself. And I was like, oh, this is my first experience. Go nice. <laughs> Go easy on me. Of course. And I think you did a great job. I think that authors are one of the, you know, when they can, authors tell their story better than anybody else. Mm. But a question for you about the audio version. Okay. Who were you talking to? So in, well, in, in broadcasting and in, in radio and all of those mediums, mm. you're only talking to one person. One person, yeah. So who were you talking to as you recorded the audiobook? Oh, so I guess anybody who's in the position that I was when I was in my late 20s, starting a business and actually thinking, well, I'm just a freelancer. But in reality, I was starting a freelance business. I knew nothing about running a business. I knew nothing about self-employment. I didn't even know anybody who had done it. So I was in this position where I was juggling being a mom for the first time and juggling being a business owner for the first time. And I couldn't find the reassurance that I wanted. So the idea is that the one person I was talking to is the person who is in that position they're perhaps new to self-employment, perhaps they're just thinking of taking the leap into running their own business, or maybe they are super established as a freelancer or a small business owner, but they are struggling with some of the, the business end of small business life. So um, things like the isolation and the imposter syndrome and the ways in which we get in our own way, like in here and in here. So that was, that was my audience. So me, you were talking to me. I was talking to you. <laughs> I just didn't know it. <laughs> it Well, all right. I started my company in January of this year. And one of the things I quickly learned is the actual business part. It's like, wow, there's a lot to it. Yeah. The, the What I do, virtual events, voiceover, those types of things, fine completely within my wheelhouse. I am comfortable. Yeah. That is not the majority of my time though. No. And this is the problem. Yeah. So, Prob so what I was going to say is th this is why I think people struggle when they first start um, self-employment because there's this expectation of freelance life being all about the freedom, the flexibility, the chance to make all the decisions for your business, to be in control. Certainly for someone who is kind of a perfectionist control freak like me, that is a, a really attractive prospect. But what we don't realize, like you say, is 
we get to the end of the first week or the first month and we look back and think, oh, hang on, I thought I was going to be spending 100% of my time sharing my special skill with the world and solving people's problems by using my talent and my secret source or whatever it is you want to call it. And in reality, you've probably spent a 50 to 60% of your time doing accounts, marketing your business, doing your social media management, fixing your computer, sales marketing, marketing admin, all these things that we actually overlook that that we have to do and and trying to wear all the hats or do all the things is the fast train to burnout and that's why I wanted to uh to cover that issue in the book. And I think you did very well with that. The the overwhelming sense that I got as I listened to you tell me about this is, ah, I'm not alone. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Reassurance. A lot of people have commented on the reassurance and that kind of feeling that it's, even if you're not listening to the audiobook version, a lot of people have said, because I naturally write in a very conversational style, that people have said, Oh, it felt like you were sitting next to me, ho- kind of holding my hand, guiding me through. It felt like a, a comforting arm around my shoulder, reassuring me that everything was going to be okay. And that that's just, that's really what I set out to achieve. And it's so great to get reviews that bear that out. It's lovely. I agree. Well, and how does that play into copywriting? So should the voice of the client match what is written? Oh, right, yeah. The voice of the client should match what's written. I thought you were gonna say, should the voice of the client match the copywriter's voice? Not necessarily. So that's kind of two separate things. So naturally I find my my natural writing style is very fluid, it's very conversational, it's very easy to read, it's quite plain English, it's no nonsense, I'm quite a heart on your sleeve type person and that shows in my writing. So I find that I tend to attract businesses who want a copywriter who can write in that way. But what people think about when they think about copywriting is, oh, you know, every client has a different tone of voice. And that's true to a certain degree. So there are slight differences and tweaks in the way you write for the business audience of your customers and your clients. But yeah, I think when you have naturally a very strong personal voice as part of your I'm not the biggest fan of the expression personal brand, but it it does what it says on the tin. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, if if naturally everything you put out there as a copywriter is reflecting your natural written style and customers come up, come to you on the back of reading the stuff that you're sharing on social media or on your blog or in publications and that sort of thing, then the chances are they are attracted to that voice naturally. So that's kind of what they're looking for. I don't very often get somebody coming to me and saying, oh, I want a really formal, um, almost um, devoid of personality. (laughs) Like everybody kind of wants the warm, friendly, approachable open that sort of tone so but that's lucky for me because that's kind of the way I tend to write anyway I think it, it means that I attract clients who are a good fit with my business and that's now, when we do the best work has the tone of writing for that audience changed over the years uh, oh, for sure when I first started out for example this was 1999 so there was no social media just let that settle for a moment, the thought of a world with no social media, quite a different prospect to where we are today. But um, yeah, the idea of writing for a digital audience when we have such short attention spans these days, you have something ridiculous like three seconds to grab your audience's attention on a website. 
I think the, the the stats vary between three seconds and seven seconds, but you know, very little in it. So it has to be concise now. We're used to getting our information in bite-sized chunks. So of course that that um that helps. And I think also the internet has made people less um traditional business speak, um things like jargon and that obfuscating kind of you know when you want to come across as really professional and therefore you use 10 words when five would do I think a lot of people are mistakenly under the impression that doing so makes them sound more intelligent more professional but actually what it does is it creates a a distance between you and your audience so you know yeah I agree it puts up a barrier it does the the ideal situation is conveying the message as easily as possible. Mm, yeah. I I have, I still think back to one of the early reviews that I got for Survival Skills for Freelancers, and it was written by another copywriter. And he actually said something along the lines of, it's so refreshing to read a book by a proper copywriter who knows how to get the message from the page to the brain with the least resistance. And every time, like, I'm, I've got goosebumps now, <laughs> I've given myself goosebumps because I love that quote so much. That really means a lot. It's like, it. I had um, a review from a guy in Canada who said, this is a book that even non-readers can learn from. He said the last book I read was Incognito Mosquito in like fifth grade. <laughs> and then and then he read mine and he gave it a five star review because he found it so intuitive. So, yeah, I feel proud of that. <laughs> All right. And it's, here's where I will admit. I was a little nervous when I had to write a review. Oh. Because you're writing a review for a writer. Exactly. Exactly. So it was, oh, how, how am I really going to convey what I'm thinking adequately and accurately for someone who writes for a living? <laughs> Do you know, you were the first person to say that to me in, in like 330 odd reviews. Nobody's ever actually voiced that before. And that's really interesting because to me, I would never... I, I just think for all authors, reviews are gold. It really, you know, we're putting something of ourselves into our books and we put mm -hmm. that out there into the world and it's a really vulnerable position to be in. So we sort of tend to think, oh God, you know, like, like this thing that I've put out there because it's kind of part of me. <laughs> and if you don't like it, I'm going to feel personally rejected. Maybe that's just me. But I do think that indie authors appreciate the reviews even more because we've had to do all the marketing, all the publicity, all the word spreading, all the everything for the book. And therefore every single review, however short or badly written I don't think I've come across a badly written review yet but I, I would never judge for that I just think the fact that somebody has taken time out of their day to say that they love this thing that I produced is that's just that means the world to me well that's a wonderful thing so how different is a book launch during yeah. COVID yeah I didn't have now. one <laughs> I really felt like I didn't have one. I wanted to celebrate it, have a little party, a little physical get together. And what happened was on the day it went live, um, I think about 12 people who'd been part of my, um, what they call a beta reading team, uh, had supported me kind of by reading the book and giving feedback and this sort mm -hmm. of thing. John Asperian was one of them. And those people joined me on a Zoom call I had a bottle of fizz. <laughs> I enjoyed celebrating, raising a glass like virtually with them. But yeah, it would have been lovely to have kind of done a little, a little tour almost, <laughs> gone and talked in person to some real life groups. And instead, everything was online. But I have to say that I had so much support. And I actually think a lot of it was people were really aware of what I was doing because the book contains quotes, advice, and mini case studies from 
a hundred freelancers across various different fields. Mm -hmm. So all the people who were quoted in the book knew that the launch was happening and they all wanted to support me and they were phenomenal. On launch day, you could not set foot on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. I didn't do Facebook, but even Facebook, there were people sharing like, oh, you know, you've got to get a copy of this book and videos and people just saying how much they loved it and you know get yourself a copy because we love this book so it oh i mean in that respect it, it couldn't have been better couldn't have asked for more wonderful and then for the audio version how long all right oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the audio version was launched or came out this year correct Correct. How long did it take you to record it? Okay. Well, um, it took me 10 months to get around to recording it, put it that way. I had this idea that I was going to launch the Kindle paperback and Audible simultaneously. I wanted to be able to kind of satisfy all those three different audiences. And it just didn't happen because of COVID. I couldn't go to a studio. I couldn't work with a sound person. And it turned out I really needed to work with a sound person. I thought I would be able to create a home studio. I got various kind of forms of uh, like a clothes era behind me with a blanket on and cushions everywhere. And it just wasn't working. So, 10 months later, I put a post on LinkedIn and I said, when do you know when to give up on an idea? And I got so much support from that post. And I was just saying, look, vote. What would you do? Should I just let it go or should I persist with it? And I got so much support. And in with hindsight some of the people who said no let it go was they said to me oh well, I only said let it go because I could tell it was stressing you out I'm like okay that's really nice to know but I had so much support from that post that I actually thought I am gonna do this and it took eight solid hours to record I, with hindsight, I would have told him I wanted to do it in two stages. I practically lost my voice by the end of the day. I've been told it doesn't show on the recording, but mm -hmm. I went home. And I thought, I felt like I'd been hit by a truck. I probably shouldn't have driven home. I felt so spaced out. It's exhausting what you do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. I loved it, though. I loved it. Yeah, it was brilliant. And... I am sure everything was done with just one take. <laughs> Maybe two. Oh, so much. Maybe two. <laughs> okay. Okay. Phew. It's not just me. Okay. <laughs> now it, you know, it is fun because you're telling a story. Yeah. So it's not. It's a very engaging book, and I would encourage anyone to go out and pick up the audio version and, and let Sarah tell you a story. Mm. Uh, get the hard copy so that you have a desk reference. Highlight it, fold over the pages. <laughs> that is, you know, yeah, that's, that is uh, a challenge with audio books. Mm. It's hard to highlight, it's hard to yeah. annotate you mark down, or at least I marked down, oh, that was in this particular chapter, mm. three minutes and 13 seconds, great. But it it feels a little bit different. Yeah, it does. And, and to confess, I didn't have an Audible account before, so I wasn't sure how it worked. So the day the Audible book came out, I signed up. And I've since listened to two books. This is Marketing by Seth Godin, and I'm currently listening to Key Person of Influence by Daniel Priestley. And I'm exactly the same. I'm frustrated by it. It's great. Seth Godin's is brilliant. I love the fact that he self-narrates. Daniel Priestley used somebody else, but he actually interacted with me on Twitter, which is kind of cool, and said he's going to read it himself the next time it's recorded. I think that would benefit. I think it would benefit from that, I should say. 
And um, I've just found, oh, same situation that actually I can't keep up with things. And I'm kind of like, oh, well, how am I going to remember where that bit is? So, um, yeah. I see a question. So, right. up. Yes. So how long? All right. We know it took you eight hours hours to record it yeah. so the book comes in just just at seven hours and 58 minutes because <laughs> no. of those two takes <laughs> no it's like three hours and 50 minutes it's a really short listen so it's a really nice one i i get off put by looking through audible and seeing oh my gosh that book's gonna take i think it's um robert cialdini's principles of influence it's something like 24 hours i'm like no no i'm not doing that <laughs> so i actually but it's a really good book yeah oh, it's a cracking book yeah brilliant all right so I, under that guys there is a book um it's a biography on Van Gogh. Okay. It is a wonderful book. It comes in at 45 hours. <laughs> 45 hours. Wow. Exactly. I've taken to record. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I do, I like the accessibility of audiobooks and mm -hmm. the fact that I can listen on my commute yeah. or torture my children <laughs> listening on my commute. <laughs> I like, I know a lot of people who are dog walkers. They all, you know, they're like going out on their bike or just going for a walk without a dog and they'll plug in when they're doing that. I think it's mm -hmm. kind of nice to have a voice in your ear. It is. Voice, I suppose. Well, but. of course. Now, have you encountered your book serendipitously out in the wild? You've been going around and you've seen someone unexpectedly oh, out in public lovely, reading your book. Lovely. No, I actually haven't had that happen. Now that's going to be on my wish list. I need that to happen. Somebody make it happen for me. Um, I've had so many emails and DMs on social media from people who I didn't know before. And um, they've messaged me to say that it has literally changed their life. Perhaps there was somebody who was thinking for a really long time about wanting to go self-employed, but not having the courage to take the leap. Or perhaps there was someone who was feeling really stuck in their freelance or self-employed career. And I mean, one person, for example, I know she had started applying for jobs and then she read my book and she has turned her business around as a result. And that for me is incredible. That feels not serendipitous exactly, but it's just so rewarding to hear those stories. It really is lovely. That is. Uh, and let's see. Other people like to listen while driving as well. Yeah. Now, the Robert Caldini book, that was the one that was the 24 hours, correct? Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, is it called The Seven Principles of Persuasion? Something like that. He has a couple. Talks about social proof and um, scarcity and reciprocity. It's that one. Really well-known book, but I hadn't actually listened to it. Before. He has a couple of books. Uh, they're all fall under the category of influence and they're all good yeah. mm. good principles through there absolutely and you're currently reading now seth godin and oh i finished this is marketing by seth godin and now okay. i am on to um key person of influence by daniel Priestley. okay both really good books so much in there that I want to be sitting with the hard copy and highlighting and folding over pages and copying quotes to my Twitter and that sort of thing so much gold in these books well yeah of course and and see that is the challenge behind or with an audiobook mm. uh, but the joy I've been out driving or listening at the gym or just out and about, I can hit rewind and yeah. wait a second, what was it? Wow. And I'll listen to a, a segment a few times just to make sure I got it exactly yeah. right. Yeah, I do that. It is handy. Mm -hmm. And when it's the author's voice in your case, it's, it's like, oh, all right, this is a beautiful thing. Now, someone else who narrates their book is 
our buddy John Esperian. Yeah. And his audiobook is again, it sounds just like him telling the story. It's not a dry read. It's not a technical book. It is John sharing a story or mm -hmm. Sarah sharing a story. And when mm -hmm. an author is sharing that story, it makes it an engaging book. Yeah, for sure. So is there another book in the offing? I think I will write another book one of these days. I'm kind of waiting until it comes to me because I was somebody who, just by way of background, I wasn't somebody who ever thought, oh, I, had, I have a book in me. I want to write a book. I never had that drive to write a book. I just decided at the start of January last year that I was going to turn a blog post that had been incredibly popular into a book. And then once I'd made that decision, that energy just drew, drove me. It was incredible. It was such an intuitive, pro obviously I'm a writer for a living, so it was slightly easier than had I not been. But the, the structure felt very intuitive. I did start off with eight myths and dropped two that didn't feel as strong. But other than that, the structure felt very intuitive. Um, I didn't write in any particular order. But as I was um, saying to you briefly before we went live, the whole process of learning to self-publish, to market and to publicize a book that you've written yourself, it's such a steep learning curve that it's practically a learning vertical. And to waste all that knowledge by not writing another book feels like it would be a shame. But there's still so much that I want to do with survival skills. So I'm not... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not ready to give up with, yeah, it's, you know, spreading the word, I think, for me, because, because the book talks so much about why, um, when you're self-employed and freelance, why mental health, like prioritizing your mental health and your well-being is so, so vitally important, because if you don't, you'll crash and burn, and if you crash and burn, you have no business. It's not like you can kind of go, oh, you know, I'm really struggling at the moment. Turn to your colleague. Can you cover this for me? Can you take over? Can you run with this? We don't have that luxury. So I really wanted to create this book that would spread the word. And that's why I've been doing so many podcast interviews and live events since. So I reckon I've done over 100 podcast interviews and live events since publishing the book. And um, the reason being, it's not to make more sales, it's to raise awareness of that really important message. And I learned that message the hard way. So I know what it's like to, to really be struggling in your business and not to feel like you've got anybody on your team and to feel like you have to do all the things. And, and it's not a nice place to be. So um, I want to really empower the community by telling them that it doesn't have to be that way there is an easier way and um yeah sure would that be it. would that be among the most surprising things you learned in creating a book what the fact that the do you mean the issues that i came yeah. across Yes. No, because um, because the issues were sort of part of the driver to create the book. So rather okay. than it being something that I learned in the process, it's something that perhaps I might have thought maybe that only affects me. And through talking to the 100 plus freelancers in the process of writing the book and incorporating their advice and their wisdom, I did realize that actually, this is something that impacts everybody. So that was something that I learned for sure. But given that before last June, when I first published the paperback version of the book and the Kindle version, I'd never done a live event or a podcast interview in my life. I would actively avoid them. If someone asked me to guest on their podcast, I'd be like, no, no, no. Rabbit in headlights kind of thing. Thinking, I can't, I I'm 
great at articulating my thoughts when I'm writing, but I've always been somebody who is, for starters, I'm a million miles an hour and I have to consciously try to slow down and it doesn't always work. But I get really passionate and heated about my subject. So I tend to go off at tangents and forget where I started the sentence. And I just kind of decided that I probably should embrace it and not run away from it. So that's what I've ended up doing. Absolutely. I mean, it's when we embrace that curiosity, that expanding of comfort zones, we grow, we learn, we are able to bring different things to the party. And having talked with you now for this yeah. session, yes, your book sounds exactly like you. You sound exactly like your book, the flow of information, <laughs> the experience expressing of ideas and concepts the yeah, writer's voice yeah that's so nice to hear someone actually someone um who's very well known in the linkedin sphere dave harland he's an absolute legend he's another copywriter he recorded a video early doors and said um this you know I've got a copy of this book in his brilliant northern Liverpoolian accent and um, everybody should get themselves a copy. And he said, I don't know if you've ever heard Sarah speak, but reading this book is like you've got her voice in your head. So that was before the Audible version was even a thing. So before the audiobook, when you're reading the paperback, it feels like having a conversation with me and you can hear my voice. So whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, most people seem to think it's good. <laughs> it is a good thing. And again, I would encourage those people who have not gotten a copy of the book yet, pick up a copy. Yeah. I would encourage people to, are you uh, open to new connections? Always. All right. Always. One of the best things to come out of publishing a book has been the way my network has grown. So if anybody is watching now, wants to connect with me, I know, Christopher, you're going to share the links. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Do you feel free to, to connect with me on social media? But if you do, just drop me a personalized note and say that you found me through Christopher, because it's always nice to have context for these it, things. It is. And a personalized note always helps. It does. Because it's... it's a generic connection request is just that it's generic. In the personalized note, yes, make sure that you mention how you heard about Sarah, that you're getting the book, something that you're looking for in her yeah. next book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it'll encourage me. And and the book is available, or I don't know how wide your reach is, but it is available in all territories through Amazon. If anybody's in the UK and wants to buy a copy direct, they can just DM me and I'll send a signed copy. Um, and the other thing that's worth mentioning, when we've been talking about the audiobook so much, I actually still have a limited number of codes. Um, if anybody in the US or the UK would like to listen to a copy of the book and is prepared to write an audible review uh, as a result of listening, just connect with me, drop me a DM and say you'd like a, a code and I'll sort you out. The only thing you need is to be UK or US based and you need a live audible account and I can sort you out one. That is a tremendous offer. You heard it here first. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining thank me today. You. This has been a delightful conversation. Yeah, I sorry. really appreciate the, yeah, yeah, I appreciate the insights you've shared and look forward to speaking with you again. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you. Take care.